So what I'm going to talk about is go, uh, need some motivation, which goes back 30 years exactly. And, and just before the Knizhnik Zamorodchikov paper, actually. So in those days, uh, I was working with Jean-Louis Gervais at the Ecole Normale, and we were trying to use uh, Polyakov's approach to string quantization to really compute uh, four-point functions, in the, at least, in, a, in more reasonable dimensions than 26 or 10, using Liouville theory. So, in the Liouville theory, which you are supposed to use, oops, where are I? It's under the ah, there, it, there is one, at least. So in the Liouville theory, which is supposed to be used for strings, then the central charge, OK, thanks. So the central charge C is 1 plus 6q squared, where q is b plus 1 over b in what is now the standard normalization of this stuff. And we were interested in trying to do uh, things in for C, in, uh, in those days, less than 1, less than 25, to be in some more physical dimension. Now, which means that B has absolute, is unimodular, actually. It's not real in those cases. So uh, we are explicitly very far away from the minimal models, where B, is ra where B squared is rational. And, and uh, I must say that I have kept away from minimal models because I just it's impossible to compute to compete with the Russian crowd <laughs> working on that subject, uh, even without the excuse of my uh, involvement in, a in the French administration. <laughs> so, so what were we trying to do in those days? Well, 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 we're saying, well, okay, we have Liouville theory, and we know that if we want to compute a string amplitude. Uh, decorating the uh, orbital modes with the Liouville modes, then we have to compute some expectation value of conformal operators in Liouville theory. So here is an ex so here is the starting point that we had in those days. Here you you recognize some of the diagrams that Sasha Zamorodchikov was uh, 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 drawing this morning. So we have here conformal. So this is the string or Liouville four-point function that we would like to compute. And then here uh, there are alphas in the standard way. And here, let me call this P2, Liouville momenta, P3, P4, something like this. I leave this line floating more or less for the moment. And so we would like to compute this for m values of the alphas or the momenta. Uh, Duville momenta such that we are we get some reasonable uh, decoration for the uh, orbital modes of the string. Now, so the dimensions of the external of these operators, delta j, where j would be one, two, three, four in a second. So this is alpha j, q minus alpha j, and that's also q squared over four. Here, there is a sign difference with what Sasha was using this morning. Minus, sorry, minus p squared, pj squared. OK, so that's pj is alpha j minus q over 2. OK, so this is what we were trying to do in those days. Now, for the... Uh, in principle, useful values of the PJs for string theory, then these conformal operators in Liouville theory uh, don't satisfy any differential, particular differential equation. And so what we said, Jean-Lou and I, was, was to try this thing to add an extra, uh, an extra leg here, a fifth leg, and consider then you recognize immediately something that Sasha was writing down this morning. So here I would have alpha 1 momentum, and Liouville momentum p1. And here the emission of uh, the vertex for the emission of one of those null states. 
So what we, are re really, what we were really trying to do in those days was compute this. So you take conformal operators in Uville, minus b over 2. So that's the, the one corresponding to this, taken at point z1, z2, v alpha 2 of z2. So I have already chosen a particular Mebius frame where of the four of the five uh, points where my, uh, vertex, my, where my conformal operators sit, uh, one is at zero, one is at one, and the other, another one at infinity, and v, four, v alpha four of infinity, and we were trying to compute this. And the idea was that this satisfies then the second order differential equation in Z1 and Z2 because this is corresponds to there is a degenerate, uh, so there is a null state uh, for that value of the external momentum uh, for this vertex. Okay, now, so because of that, then I said this differential, this differential, oh, actually, I must say, yes, uh, listening to Sasha Zamoloshikov this morning, uh, when he was writing something very close to this, I was very much afraid that he was going to describe exactly what I'm going to say. <laughs> so, so, so fortunately, uh, the structure of these uh, things is rich enough that there is still some place for myself. <laughs> so, yes, so this, I have to write some relatively tedious formula it is known that this can, t can be, this four-point function can be, satisfies the differential equation for the following quantity. You don't have to really, to really uh, follow exactly all of this. I take out some relatively trivial factors. One minus Z2, two minus two, alpha two, alpha three, 1 minus z1, z2, power b alpha 3, g of z1, z2. Where g, this function g of z1, z2 satisfies this, this, that special second order differential equation coming from the fact that I have here in our state, uh, which is actually essentially the Knizhnizh-Damolotsikov equation, except that it is written for Uville. It's the same idea. We use the fact that there is a null state to obtain a differential equation for this. And then, so I should say, z1 and z2 are the parameters, uh, the integration, uh, whatever, the, the, I should say, the cross ratios corresponding to uh, these legs in this dual diagram representation. And what we are after in principle is on this g of z1, z2 is to take the limit z1 equal to 0 to factor out this uh, extra piece and obtain ultimately the function, the four-point function as a function of z2 only, the conformal block as a function of z2. Now, when z2 is 0, actually, then we, f we are sitting precisely on one of the poles here, and we know that we have a hypergeometric equation as a function of z1. But, and then we can try to solve in powers of z2, and we can solve recursively, which we did in those days. But it, this is not very helpful, because what we really want is z1 equal to 0 as a complete function and a complete function of z2. So ultimately, uh, well, let's, uh, let me actually write down the differential equation for, for this g. So it's of the following form, z1, 1 minus z1, 1 minus z1, z2, dz1 squared g, plus then there are some coefficients, bz1 plus cz1, z2, plus dz1 squared z2, times dz1 g, then there is a z2 derivative. Is this d z1 squared or dz1 squared? D, z1, d, d times z1 squared. The first one is a second order operator? Or the this is d, yes, this is a second order, sorry. So square of this. 
the square is up there, yes, sorry. Yeah. Bz2, 1 minus z2, dz2, g plus e plus f z2 plus h z1 z2, g equals 0. Now, and a, b, c, d, these uh, a, b, c, d, e, f, h are functions of the, the external deltas, of the external momenta, and of the internal, the internal momentum here, p, right? And delta here, this delta is the delta of the internal momentum. This is really what, essentially what Sasha was or, or already introducing this morning, right? Delta is just alpha. Q minus alpha is also Q squared over 4 minus P squared. And, and so, so when you actually work the thing out, which is not very complicated, then what you find is that this, this say, if Z2, the derivative with respect to Z2 were not there, which is the classical limit, if you wish, when B goes to 0, then this is the Hoyne equation, as is well known. And the accessory parameter of the Hoyne equation is related to the internal momentum. Okay, now, so, so what can we say about this? Well, when z2 goes to 0, right? Ah, yes, one thing that we wanted, uh, I have to say, that the boundary condition is that g of z1, z2 is of the form g0 of z1 plus z2, g, g1 of z1 plus etc. when z1 goes to 0 with all these GZ, GIs, GIs regular at z1 equals 0. So when z2 is 0, then this is the hypergeometric equation, which again was used by uh, Sasha and Alyosha Zamorochikov in 1984 to compute the structure functions of uh, the conformal operators in Duville theory. So, but we are, we really want it for Z2, for completely Z2 different from zero. Now, okay, now, so the idea is then, suppose that we have one solution uh, of, we happen to lay, uh, to lay our hands on one particular solution of this equation, for values of the conformal charge and the internal momentum here. And then what, what else can we find other solutions like this? See, the aim at the end is, would have been, of course, to compute a four-point function interesting for string theory, but that is not the case, at least not yet. But at least obtain some explicit formulas where we could have some explicit formula for, for a function of these external alphas and of the internal momentum in which we could, we could check explicitly the conformal bootstrap by integrating over p. And because uh, in 94, uh, uh, Sasha and Alyosha uh, uh, showed the conformal bootstrap by numerical integration over p, and we would like Perhaps it would be amusing to find cases where we could do it analytically. And so this is, the, this is actually the case. OK, so, okay so, so then the basic formula for, ah, yes, one thing I, I want to say first is the following, that, so I say, we are really interested in the case where g is regular when z1 goes to 0. But however, just like f this equation has uh, many properties which are quite close, quite similar to those of the hypergeometric equation. Especially, you can, you can find that, for let me maybe write down a formula for the hypergeometric equation, which some people will probably recognize, A, B, C, Z. The, the standard hypergeometric equation satisfies the following identity
so that you see here that there is a relationship between, by put with, thanks to with this extra power of 1 minus z, between the behavior of the hypergeometric at z equals 0 and at z equals 1. So, so here something similar occurs. And it's interesting. And you see that when you do this change, then the coefficients of the hypergeometric uh, 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 function are changed a little bit in this way. And I here, this is the same, actually. You can change. What? One minus z, sorry. What? No, no, it, no I'm sorry. It is still c. Well, look. No, I think this is still true, but this is a little bit, I should say. Maybe I should write it this way. Because, because this is regular. No, no, this is exactly true, I think. Yeah? I think this is correct. OK, so this. You can do the same. You suppose, suppose, forget about the boundary condition on G, and then say, well, suppose I have a solution of this, and then try another solution, G1, whatever, some, which would be Z1 to some power times G. And try to find a power here of Z1 such that G1 satisfies the same equation, of, but with different different values of the, uh, of the uh, coefficients a, b, c, et cetera, and see what this ch means in terms of the external dimensions which are here. Well, what you find is that, indeed, there is this possibility that there is a power here such that g1 satisfies the same type of equation. And when you do that, you find that this amounts to change p into minus p, p1 into minus p1. So this is, a, this is a very simple interpretation in terms of the external momentum, p1. And then th you can find a G, another g1, which would be like 1 minus z1 times g, again to some power. And this turns out to change p2 into minus p2. And then there is another one with 1 minus z1, z2 to some power again. And this changes p3 to minus p3. And there is no corresponding formula for p4, because actually, in the equation, only delta 4 appears. So that p4 appears only squared. OK, so these are, so if I am in a some kind, in a four-dimensional space for all these momenta, p1, p2, p3, p4, then I see that I have symmetries somehow uh, by reflection with respect to one of the hyper coordinate hyperplanes. And I can use this if I have a solution, if I know something in one case for this differential equation in order to find new solutions. And OK, so that's one part of what I was going to say, what I want to say. Oops, this is a bit dark. OK, next. Well, next is uh, actually coming from one of Bateman's formula. Suppose that I have, again, suppose that I have a g of z1, z2, which satisfies the equation. And let me try this, in this integral transformation. Let me call this one u. du over z1 minus u to some power x. x to be determined. And let me call this g sub integral, right? i of z1, z2 equals this. Then I say, well, can I find an x such that if g satisfies an equation of that type, gi satisfies the same type of equation. So I don't leave things uh, here. Either it's a contour integral, or it's a contour which ends at one of uh, at points where, on the right-hand side, there is uh, no integer power or negative integer power. 
so that I can throw away uh, integration by parts terms. Okay. So I put I do I put this in the equation, and then actually when you do this in the hypergeometric equation, you find that for any x, you get a new hypergeometric equation uh, with uh, different coefficients, of course. But in the case of the uh, Hoyne's equation, of Hoyne's equation, I, I may call it so, even including the z2 piece, the dz2 piece, then you find that x has to have one of two values only, which is uh, amusing. And these two values have actually very simple, a very simple expression in terms of the momenta p. x is 1 minus b squared over 2 minus b times p1 plus p2 plus p3 plus or minus p4. And so plus or minus p4 because obviously, because again, as I said, also only p4 squared, which appears in the, in the equation, in the coefficients of the, of uh, the equation. So that's one thing. So x has to satisfy this. And gi, so of g1, of z1, z2, then will depend on pi, p, pj primes, right? pj, j equals 1, 2, 3, 4, which are transformed from the p's, just like in the, geometric in the hypergeometric equation, when I do the same thing, then the, the new coefficients depend also not only on the original coefficients of the hypergeometric, but also, also on x. So p prime j. And what's amusing is that so the, the vector p1, say p prime 1, p prime 2, p prime 3, p prime 4, is equal to some matrix which is minus a half, one half, one half, one half, one half, minus a half, one half, minus one half, one half, one half, minus a half, one half, one half, one half, one half, minus a half, times P1, P2, P3, P4. Ah, sorry, missing a very important thing, plus B over 4, that's 1, 1, 1, 1. Is this an SOE triality transformation? Pardon? Is this an SOE tri triality transformation? Uh, well, that's not my interpretation immediately, but what this is, M, this matrix M, is the reflection with respect to the vector, to this vector. A perpendicular is the hyperplane perpendicular to this vector. M is reflection, reflection with respect to the hyperplane uh, perpendicular to 1, 1, 1, 1. So, so I start with an initial, va initial values of the p's, then reflection with respect to the hyperplane, and then translation perpendicular, uh, par well, perpendicular to the hyperplane per parallel to this vector. P minus P. Pardon? Pardon? Well, that's a version of the 1 minus the moment, which is... No, no, it's different. Minus right, something like that. It's a version well, it's another well, p into minus p. But here, this is not really p into minus p. It's a mm, little bit different. To q minus mm, no? no, I don't think so. See, uh, here I'm not changing p into my p's into minus p's. P into minus p is would be the ma would be a matrix of the type minus one 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 one, for example. Okay, this would be change p1 into minus p1, reflection to the one of the coordinate hyperplanes. Here it's reflection to with respect to another another hyperplane. Okay. So so okay, so so this is what we find. Now how ca so this you can repeat this provided that well, you don't hit cases where you wouldn't, couldn't do a reasonable, if I may say so, uh, choice of integration uh, uh, boundaries or uh, contours or whatever. 
And if you repeat this, then you find that you can go on a lattice with uh, um, a spacing b over four more b or b over four more or less. And so, for example, if you start from an arbitrary p one, p two, p three, p four, and then apply the following string of of uh, transformation, first i this integral transformation that I wrote here, then reflection with respect to some of the coordinate hyperplanes, and then so it's successively r four, r three, r two. So this means changing p into minus p p uh, yes which is, uh, no, sorry, p4 into minus p4, p3 into minus p3, p2 into minus p2, then again i, then r4, r3, again this, the same set of transformations, again i, and then finally r1. Then what you find is that this, for arbitrary values of the p's, then this is changed into p1 plus b, p2, p3, p4. So this means that for an ob from starting from an arbitrary, from some set of p's, then I can navigate in the lattice. So this is a, a fine vial group of, of SOA. Pardon? What you generated is a fine vial group of SOA. A, a fine value, uh, OK. SOA. So p goes to minus p and exchange of uh, And exchange of. The finite vial group for fine S SOA d4, and this is the Okay. Okay. So, so obviously, so that means that you can go on a lattice with. Uh, here you could have, uh, obviously have p1 plus n1b, p2 plus n2b, p3 plus N n3b, etc. It's an affine shift. Yeah. An affine shift. And then one and two and three and four can be negative or positive uh, as you wish, because you can invert this animal. OK, so that's one thing. That's one of the things that you can do. This is not the only one. I'll mention perhaps some, something perhaps even more interesting at the end. OK, now the problem is, what are we going to apply this set of transformations to? What, what, is, what will be the starting point for this p1, p2, p3, p4? And OK, maybe I can continue here. Now, this then, w the starting point, uh, I think the best, oops. So the starting, for the starting point, let, let me uh, use what appears in the, pap the paper that we wrote four years ago with Volodya Fateyev, uh, Sasha, uh, Alyosha, uh, a little bit enough. Myself and Enrico Onofri. And now, which uses some manipulation of the starting point of the, which is the Hoynes equation, uh, plus the, the DZ2 term. Now, as you know, the Hoynes equation can be. Uh, change can be changed into elliptic variables and it will include elliptic functions and uh, I particularly love elliptic functions because more than 40 years ago when I was in Princeton John Schwartz remembers with Joel Shirk we had a lot of fun playing with elliptic functions which appear in loop diagrams of the string so uh, I have a love affair with elliptic functions and I said well let's try let's try uh, using a little bit b more elliptic functions to see what happens to this equation when we go to elliptic variables. Now, so use the, the make the following change, of, and this is really very quite remarkable in my opinion. What happens when you go to elliptic functions? So define new k is the complete int elliptic integral. I'm going to say in a minute what it is du over root u1 minus u1 minus u z2, complete elliptic integral here, where z, oh, so k is 0 to pi over 2 
1 minus k squared sine squared t to the minus a half dt. And z2 is, which is k squared, this is the elliptic modulus k. Theta 2, f that's where the theta functions come in, of 0 and tau, over theta 3, 4, of 0 and tau. So you make this uh, strange uh, change of variables. OK. And then furthermore, define a g. The, the original g of z1, z2, call it g, make this extra change of function of then of nu and tau times this capital G of nu and tau. And then you find that this capital G satisfies a relatively simple, a relatively simple equation. This is actually known to uh, you see, the fact that there is this dz2 is going to turn this extra derivative with respect to z2 is going to come out rather nicely. You find that g satisfies the following equation, d squared g d nu squared. So this is what remains of the dz1 squared and the dz1, more or less, if you wish. And then there is the dz2 piece, and z2 is a function of tau, of this, uh, this the elliptic uh, tau plus 4i pi b squared dg dz2 d tau, sorry, sorry dg, dg d tau. So this looks like a time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation. And then there is 16 k squared. So k squared is a function of tau. Then e plus fz2 plus h minus b squared q central charge e the other com the other com the other elliptic integral and let me write this in the special case n4 and 4 plus 1 over 4 dn squared and now i should say that this so this is the case alpha 1 equals alpha 2 equals alpha 3, equals minus q over 4, minus 1 over 4b. I have chosen this particular values of the external dimensions. You'll see why in a second. And alpha 4 is, I choose it to be alpha 4 minus q over 2. Let me say it. Minus 1 over 4b, minus n4 over 2b. And so E, F, and H, as again, as I said, are only functions of the alphas. So this is a function of Z2 only. And I have here, this dn is the uh, elliptic function, uh, you know, the ratio of uh, the, the, the third elliptic functions, dn, well, the standard thing. Yes? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, 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 there is G here. So, so this is amusing because here what we find is when, when b is 0 here, when I don't include the tau derivative, then this is for integer d, for integer n, 4, this is a Taibisch Verdier potential. A particular one. Lame is the Lame equation, yes. Lame equation, and this particular case of a Trebisch Verdier potential, and we'll see generalization of that. So, uh, amusing by itself. And so, what's uh, even more uh, um, uh, amusing is that we can also, so, when, when there is no tau derivative, then the solution of this is known for arbitrary values of the. Uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the internal momentum p or uh, of the uh, supplementary parameter of of the uh, of the of the initial Hoyne equation 
So this is all. This is known. But what's amazing is that there is a solution. So you see, this is very strange because this is like a, a, this is like a Schrodinger equation in this elliptic potential, but time uh, time dependent. But the time is the uh, uh, is related to the uh, to the uh, uh, elliptic potential itself. So this is uh, quite strange, and it turns out that this has an explicit in this case. Okay, this, but these particular values of the external dimensions. This has a, an explicit solution in, with an, an explicit integral representation, g of nu and tau, which is exponential 2i b p b p pi nu times an integral d nu 1 rho of nu 1 and tau theta 4 of nu plus nu 1 over theta 4 of nu. And where rho of nu 1 and tau is some relatively strange looking animal, but which is found by explicit calculation. Exponential 2i pi b over b, sorry. P mu 1 times quite a few other terms, which depends only on tau, which I don't really want to make explicit. This is just a, a red theta function, so various theta functions again, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but which depend only on tau. Now, the, uh, sorry, here this is mu 1, not very well written. So, this for an, so we have an explicit representation of the solution in terms of elliptic functions and for all values of the internal momentum. And an amusing remark is that when b goes to 0, which is the classical limit, uh, and uh, so and uh, b p b p1 Sorry. Yes. B times P finite. Then the solution, this, you can do steepest descent on this. And then you find that uh, new, new one is fixed to be 2i pi B times p plus theta prime 1 of nu 1 over theta 1 of nu 1 equals 0. Because you see here you have a 1 over b squared, and here you have a 1 over b. So when you do steepest descent, you find that this is the solution. And the solution is exactly the solution of the initial Lamé equation. Uh, which was found by uh, Hermite 150 years ago, or something. Okay, so we have here a, a, an extension including this tau derivative and an explicit integral representation. So, so what else? So, in the paper, in that paper with uh, Volodya and Alyosha Lilvinov and Enrico Ronofri then we have other, other cases where we, can, we could find, indeed, explicit integral representations. So and, uh, other explicit, ex uh, 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 explicit solutions. Or oh, I should have said, yes. So sorry, this is in the case n4 equal to 1. So still, again, so if I, if I take these alpha 1 minus q, alpha 1 minus q over 2 is equal to minus 1 over 4b. In general, minus n1 over 2b. And same for alpha 2, alpha 3, and alpha 4. So this solution here, this equation here, was in the case n1 equals n2 equals n3 
equals 0, and 4 equal to 1. Then, we ha then you see there is an, if an, an integral representation with one variable, nu1, one, one integration variable. Or sh I should have called it nu4, actually. And what we have explicit integral representations when these n4 uh, arbitrary, belonging to n, say, an arbitrary integer. And then we also have, you can also have two of them equal to 0. And then n n n3 equals n4 in n. And finally, n1 equals n2 equals n3 equals n4 in n, in, in uh, arbitrary integers. And actually, you get these other cases from the first one by using duplication formulas for, 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 the, for elliptic functions. So these are relatively trivial extensions of the of the, the most the, the, this case of this case now the amusing thing also is that we have that so these are the usual these are the, the, uh, some of the trebuchet verdier potentials uh, where you can find an extension with the tau derivative here now what's amazing is that we also found more such values of uh, the ends where uh, these could be solved w w with an explicit integral representation. And so, so you see, what does this mean? Minus n1 over 2b. And what we actually find is that you can also add minus mb and 1b like this. So this is a large potential, if I may say so. And this is a small potential, 1b is small. But we have an integral representation for say, going back to n4, n4 and m4, m4 and n4 belonging to n. And here, similarly, we could have m1 equals m2 equals 0, and m4, m3 equals m4 belonging to n. And here, all of them. also belonging to in n. So we have explicit uh, integral representations for a relatively large number of values of these n's, which is, uh, <coughs> uh, of course, uh, these cases where m is non-zero uh, disappear in the classical limit. And we're not immediately interested in them in, in the classical limit. And we have all these. And then we can, to all these particular cases, we can apply the uh, integral transformation that I mentioned in the first part of the talk and get even more uh, explicit representations of these conformal blocks. When z1 goes to 0, uh, ultimately when z1 goes to 0, we get a conformal block for the Liouville theory, a four-point function. Uh, you can, we can get even more such explicit re in integral representations we can't, we can't yet go everywhere because we are re restricted on this lattice. So the conjecture that we had in the paper was that actually we could get more integral representations involving, well, away from these particular cases where uh, two of the ends uh, are, or of the ends are uh, or four of them are equal. We can go in principle, we hope to get everywhere for all values of n and all values of m, which is not the case yet, even though all values of m we can already reach more or less thanks to the integral representation I was mentioning. And let me uh, finish. I'm, I'm not yet. I'm almost there. Let me finish with one amusing remark, apparently, is that this integral representation that I wrote down uh, can be used to reach values of the ends, uh, which are for all values. Uh, for example, apparently, apparently, I haven't checked all the details, but that reflection formula with respect to that hyperplane, right, uh, perpendicular to the 1, 1, 1, 1 axis, can be used to reach values of the ends here, which are all 
of them half integral, and which is where there is not supposed to be known a solution of even the case where tau is, uh, doesn't appear, except that there is a, uh, a strange remark in a paper by Gaston Darboux that dating back to 1882, who says that he has found a solution indeed of the, uh, well, not exactly the Lamy equation, but the case where there, there are all n's and they're all half integer. And so maybe that's what he had found in those days, but it, he hasn't published the details, and apparently it's not in the literature yet. So he did not have to publish. Probably. Maybe so like Fermat, then. maybe like Fermat, uh, he <laughs> it's somewhere in a footnote <laughs> of one of his uh, notes. So, what? What? The Fermat conjecture was correct. Yes, yeah, but, it but it's not clear that his, uh, his proof was correct. This conjecture seems to me not correct. Well, we'll have to discuss that in private. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Do, do you have a, an algebraic interpretation of the equation you want? In terms of Sorry? Do you have an algebraic interpretation in terms of the Russell algebra of this equation? In of, this, in, of this equation in terms of your Russell? It looks like a sugar rock construction mm -hmm. on the toes. Mm -hmm. No, it looks like the mm -hmm. Bernard equation. Yeah. Yeah. The homological Bernard equation. Yes. Well, certainly, this is, 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 is the same as the original one. Uh, no, because this one is on the torus. This yes, this is on the uh, torus now. No, this is on the torus, yes. So there are what? Yes. Construction on the torus? Yes. So LGO is uh, Yeah. You see some change of variables, which looks like they are so going exactly. from, from Liouville to SL2 with the mean. Yeah, but is then you mm -hmm. go from the new vectors at level 2 to the formula for L0. Well, initially, uh, initially I was uh, I'm uh, I'm on a sphere. I'm not I'm not I'm on the sphere here, and here I'm on a torus. Yeah. Yeah, there yes. are some here four point functions on the, on the it's sphere which are related sphere. to one point functions. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's what it is in this case. Actually, this is a one point function of the torus. Yeah. Yes. That's a transform. A transform. Yes. So, no, no, so this five point. Conform block of, of on the sphere is equal to four point conform block of on, on the uh, of SL2. On, yes. on, on the sphere. On the but then it's probably for yeah. special yeah. but it's yeah. 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 can probably be related to one point on the torus. But then if it's really the one point function of the torus, you have no, you should have an explanation yeah. why you have integral yeah. representation yeah. or you should yeah. be able to write uh, or possible integral representation. So one point function of some vertex operators on the torus. So you can compute them on well, it depends on the vertex operator. Yeah. <laughs> then it will tell you when you, you, have an when you can do it and when you cannot do it, yes. So? Well, probably Vorodia would, if he doesn't speak with his neighbor, he would answer. <laughs> but oh, Sasha? I have very technical questions. Probably I, I was confused with uh, the first part of your talk. You, you demonstrated us the, this. Uh, uh, the transformation yes. which uh, ended up with the shifting of P1 yes. by B. Yes. So, uh, so uh, I, my, my, my understanding is that you can, uh, you can shift every one of these P's yes. yes. by positive now, uh, some or negative. Positive number. Or negative because you can invert the transformation. I mean, each. How could you invert the well, because each of these, uh, easy, each of these operators are reflections with re in this four-dimensional space, and which have an inverse. This the is transformation which you have shown us was the, the I, I don't know how you inverted. It's applied twice. It was a reflection. So it was a reflection. So if you apply it twice, it should be an identity. Right. Uh, yes. You should apply to the other side. You, you conjugate R with the uh, yes. I oh, you, R. You, you, you use R separately, just uh, changing P to minus yes, P yes, by yes. this elementary yes, operation. Yes, so yes, that's yes. why you say the letters. Yes. All right. OK. So. So really, uh, 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 this shift of B generates not the, not the integer belonging to N, but integer belonging to Z. Yes. 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 Yes.
n is non negative well n to 1 minus n here here n into one n into 1 minus n is just the so same. So my understanding of the, is, is that this additional piece adds another uh, integer which can be now positive or negative. Yes. Yes, it's yes, 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 yes. Other yes, questions? Yes.